So I'm talking about the shepherds. So three wise men. So I just thought, actually, uh, we, we're, we're having an all-age service today, and I was actually looking for um, kind of a cartoony version of that. And whilst I was searching for something to play that was going to appeal to, to our younger audience, I fell across that. And it may not be everybody's cup of tea. It may be thinking there's a classic hymn, classic carol, or stuff like that. But it stopped and made me think about the words of the song. It is a little bit more melancholy, um, and people think that that they've spoiled the song, but I was just, I was a bit blown away by it. So I actually, my message today is a Christmas carol. If you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter two. Now, those who know, who have been here, well, most of you already know me. Um, God has a tendency of changing my preachers. I wasn't preaching today on um, the wise men. But God has really laid it on my heart. So, we're just going to read the visit of the wise men, as always reading from the ESV, starting in Matthew 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people of Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Do you know that account is only mentioned in Matthew's Gospel? So why why is it important to Matthew? Was kind of my my first kind of instinct. Why is Matthew the only one that's mentioning this? Well, first we need to understand the book of Matthew, um, which is an anonymous author. we attribute it to the to the the apostle Matthew, but it was said that it, you know theologically that or not theologically that actually Matthew didn't write this, but it may have been it's an account. Can you everybody hear me by the way? Yeah. Um, but actually the audience was Christian Jews, so there's particular things that reference to Judaism that are relevant to people here that may be not relevant to people. So hence Mark just gets straight into the gospel. It struck me why mention the star, and this was something that was relevant to to the Jewish people. We believe this is a miraculous sign of Jesus' birth. We hear it, we've heard the, the, the carol, we've heard the story that they followed this star. So we see it just as, as, a, as, a, as a simple, it's just kind of, of, of the first sat-nav. It was just a case of, like, we, we people, we're going to hide this, we're going to have this here, people are going to be following it. But actually, it's it's kind of a bit more deeper than that. There's, um, there's, it's actually a fulfillment of a prophecy. So within the old, in Numbers 24, 17, there's actually a star prophecy. You remember um, 
Balaam with his donkey, the talking donkey. Um, there was there was within that he's then talking about, and if I can quickly, I could probably find it, but I won't. But it's making a reference to a star, and it's actually in fact actually the quote that's in here from verses six and to you o Bethlehem the land of Judah by no means among rulers and other Judah from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people of Israel was that section so what I got to think about was the star about the three wise men about why is this all relevant why does this all come together Why did Herod get so upset? We go back, if we look here, and Herod had got really upset about the coming of this baby Jesus. And why was it that he actually got so upset about this that he went and asked of the people? This goes back to the prophecies. Um, and sorry, that bit was a, the bit that was in, uh, was in Micah, sorry. Um, but the star prophecy was a fulfillment that there would be a star coming from Bethlehem. And do we know um, that Bethlehem actually means, um, sorry, the bre city of bread? Oh, no, bread? House of, house of bread. Sorry, house of bread. And so we talk about the bread of life. So there's all these things, all these things that are coming to one another, that are all coming, that are reference to, um, to the Jews, that are reference to this. And Herod is there getting quite upset. He asks the scribes where this star is going to be. Because... Why? Because the wise men have come and said, we're looking for the king of the Jews. Now Herod was, um, I don't know if we, we, we know that he was, it's actually what's called a vassal state. So it's a bit like a puppet state. So Herod was actually made king with um, the kind of authority, with the, um, the guidance, with the, the kind of, again, you do this for me and I'll do that for you. So he was kind of a little beholden to the Roman Empire. He would supply them with stuff and he would do as they were told. So he was never really, we see a lot of that in politics today. We see a lot of it that, that actually, who is the person we see? Is that the person um, that's actually calling the shots or is it just a front man? So Herod was a little bit like that. Now Herod, as a person, actually came from the Edomite line of people, so Herod, so he was from Esau's line. Um, he was um, a pro Roman person because he got a lot off the Romans he was awarded the title king of Judea you know and read into that king of the Jews so this is a, f a threat to him he's saying who's this child king of the Jews is he coming to steal what I've worked for so hard for what I've, I'm trying to keep somebody's going to take my crown from me so you know he was um, Herod would also um, you know, would have some arguments with the Pharisees and the Sadducees about certain things, um, but he would, um, he so he, but he was also in, you know, the priests and the or various prophets. He would go inside. He would know because of his Jewish history. He would know his Jewish background. He would know all the prophecies. He would know what was going to happen. So the sign um, of the star and the wise men coming and saying about, I'm come to find the King of the Jews. All of a sudden, he's like, somebody's going to take this from me. And we've all seen the films and all these sort of things where Herod's kind of a very pompous, self-living, you know, man. He's like, you know, peel me a grape type of person. He wants all this riches, this glory. He likes the title of being king. So somebody's going to throw him to that. He's not particularly happy about that. So to understand why Herod was so upset, we have to understand why Herod was who he was and where he came from and that he was threatened by the birth of Jesus. Herod had asked the wise man when he came to visit them to report back, to let him know where he was. Now, actually, when we, we hear about the slaughter of the, of the babies later on and, and that, we actually, we, I mean, I, in my own head, I'd got this picture of like thousands of babies um, that are going to be, you know, two-year-olds and under that are going to be done. It's actually because of the size of Bethlehem and stuff like that. We're talking apparently 20, 30, 40 babies is what theologians are coming back with and saying that it may have been as many as up to that. But obviously, one is too many. So the wise men obviously then had the angel come back to them and, and decided not to go back to Caesar. 
But what I was really impressed with, or what really was impressing me, was the particular gifts that they brought to him. Why were these three wise men, which actually we talk about the wise men and we talk about actually the word magi, um, we look at it, they're actually astrologers. And so the, and the significance of the star, uh, um, they're astrologers, they would be following stars, they wouldn't understand the significance of the stars. That's not an endorsement of astrology in the Bible, by the way, just before anybody gets in, into the wrong aspect there. But I was thinking, why those gifts? Why the, the gold? Why the frankincense? And why the myrrh? What is the significance of those gifts? Now, I was doing my study. I was reading a little bit about this. And I really felt that as I went through them, the significance of these gifts was, was not just about... Um, what they could bring, what these were, these were you know nice things to bring, but actually look what the, the meaning behind those. Now, in ancient times, these were standard gifts that people would give to a king or or a deity. They weren't, you know, this was this, this was kind of pretty much standard. So, be a precious metal. So this precious metal that they first bought was gold. Now that's actually representing his status of kingship. So this is about his golden crown. This is representing who he was going to be. The incense um, that they brought was frankincense. Now this actually then indicates a symbol of his priestly role, his future role as he's coming to be a rabbi and a priest. Also as a side note was that I didn't know this until till the other day that frankincense apparently has healing properties. So and it, and is used. So we can then take that from not only being being a a, um, a, a priest, but also then look at Jesus's miracles of healing. And then finally, which this kind of just then started to blow me away a little bit. We talk about myrrh. And does anybody actually really know what myrrh is? No. Well, it's an anointing oil used for embalming. Okay. So why would you do that? Well, it's a prefiguration of Jesus dying and being embalmed. So the gifts that the wise men bring him are actually so significant. They're not just standard gifts. They're telling us about who Jesus is going to be. And I think when I hear... We three kings of Orient. I kind of, I then start thinking, you know, songs that aren't, you know, one in a scooter, one in a car, and all of that. But I don't actually then think about the significance of the songs and what those words were. And listening to the version of the song that we just listened to, actually, you get to listen to the words a little bit more, and you actually hear the importance of that. So with what you know now, if you didn't already know, you probably did, but I didn't, with what I know now, and listening to that song brings a completely different element. Because I look at those things and I go, you know, to my, I just thought they were nice presents. We do as a kid, don't we? We think, oh, we want a bit of gold. Frankincense and myrrh, I don't really know what they were. I didn't really care. I got gold. Um, it was a case of uh, they had nice things. I don't really know what they are. So it kind of just then got me thinking a little bit about Jesus' life. I then went to look back at uh, of what I had learned. So we have the star, we have the star of David. We have the Bethlehem, we have the house of bread, the bread of life. We have a priest that's been brought to us in, in, in with the incense. And he's a sacrificial lamb. And we talk about the anointing. All. But I left intentionally the gold till last. We have a crown, a gold crown. He's a risen king. So even at that point, he's being crowned as a risen king. Now, as I'm thinking this and I'm reading this and I'm going through all of these, I then turn in my own head, um, and for those who've seen one of my T-shirts, is Luke 19.10, for he came to seek and save the lost. So even at the point of his birth, his mission was decided. It wasn't just, oh, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. You know, nothing is an accident. God knows what he's doing. Sometimes in this world, you sometimes we think and we go through our lives and we go, actually, do you know what you're doing, God? Well, you know, 
I don't always know what he's doing, but he knows what he's doing. And there's people who aren't Christians, or even some of us who are Christians, and we have no idea what he's doing. But actually, it's not my right to always know what he's doing. But I know, because he's got a divine right to pretty much do what he wants. Well, there's no pretty much about it. He does. He gets to do what he wants. But Jesus' mission, to seek and save the lost. So right at the beginning of Jesus' life, he was already, I mean, not only, not only was he here to seek and save the lost, but people were coming to him. He was attracting people from far and wide even before he was born. What does that tell you about the potential attraction of this man who was actually 100% God, 100% man? And to me, as I'm going on as the, the eternal evangelist, going, that pretty much sounds like a gospel message to me. If ever I've heard a gospel message, it's like, you know, it was always plan A. It wasn't like Jesus was born, he's going to do a few miracles, hopefully that things are going to be seeked and sought and saved and, and this is going to happen. It was always a plan by significance of the oil that actually he was, he was here to die for us. And why was he here to die? He was here, as John talked about our heart, and to give us a pure heart. He, he, Jesus came and shed his blood sacrificiously that, that we may have eternal life and have a pure heart. Is that not the best Christmas present ever? The best present ever. You can keep your gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm going to take Jesus every day of the week. Amen? So Jesus was always plan A. Now I then go back further. So this was, we haven't even got past chapter 2 of the New Testament, and we're already telling it that Jesus came to die for us. But we can go further back. Genesis 3.15 which is the third chapter, after God's created the world, and we all know about the fall. But then, I'll just quickly flick through so I can get this. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Woman, Mary. I will give it between your offspring and her offspring, Jesus. He shall bruise your head, and he shall bruise his heel. So we're already talking the gospel message within the third chapter of our book. This, wasn't, this was never, ever plan B it was always going to be this way so people think that God doesn't know what he's doing we have a, a historical account and we've discussed that in the last couple of weeks haven't we how accurate this is and how reliable this is and how relevant this book is so we can't I think if, well, if you've listened to me and you've heard me uh, and this is I'm just repeating what other people say I have nothing new to offer I'm just condensing what other people are saying and predominantly what the Bible says. So really, in, in this kind of, this, 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 this message today, which was going to be a short message because it's an all day service, so you've pretty much had me, was always going to be about remembering the reason for the season. But it's not just this season. We remember it because of Christmas and the commercial aspects of it. But we should remember this every day. What do you do with that information? Do we use it? Do we just remember it at Christmas? I mean, here's my challenge to you. And for those people who know Jesus, is it life-changing? Is it really life-changing? Are you making a change in your life and in your heart? Because if you're not, you've not fully accepted the gift. So I'm, I'm asking people today to look at the reason for the season, the reason being Jesus and the reason he's here and the reason why he had to be here. And was that because we can't do it by ourselves. We can only do it with him. So for those of you who have accepted Christ, I challenge you to really look at what that means to you and not just like, I've got my pass. Actually look at that, that we are, we are, the Great Commission tells us to go make disciples. That's what I'm commissioned to do. That's why I stand here today. And I'll do what I can. But we're all commissioned to do that. We're all priests. Those of you who may or may not know Jesus, which I'm hoping looking around is none of you, but I'm going to say it anyway, is the fact that if you haven't decided to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, then do it today. It is the best thing that you will ever do. 
Let him make a change in your life. Let him refresh your heart. So, that's all I have for you today. I hope that you will listen to that. And, and really, yes, Dave, take it in. But, th- but remind yourselves of those gifts, the three wise men, and why they brought those gifts. Because to me, that was really the message that I wanted to get through, was the relevance to, to you know the, the message to the Jews and particularly Christian Jews but in particular then why those people you know wouldn't have those those gifts so let me just pray father I just want to thank you I thank you for your perfect gift that you gave us and as we remember it this season Lord I just pray that we act upon that that we actually embrace that that we do not take that for granted Lord Jesus that actually each and every day we remember why And we remember what you did and actually how we should respond. So, Father, I pray for us all now. Bless us and cleanse us by the blood of the Lamb. In your name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen.